What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Johnny Mac here. Just wanted to give you a heads up that if you are looking for a community that is open to discussion as far as mentorship, conservation, the wild, becoming a better person, and all of that, there is a group for you on Facebook, and it is called Soul Seekers. Soul Seekers, we are all about making ourselves a better person. We're all about making sure hunting lasts for generations to come and encouraging people to get plugged in. Whether you are someone who has something to give or someone who needs to soak it up like a sponge, this is a community for you, and I encourage you. I strongly encourage you that if you're on Facebook to join Soul Seekers, and if you're not on Facebook, hop on there just for that group. It is only going to be as powerful as we all make it. And so just remember that life happens for you. It doesn't happen to you and that you can't outgive good. You can't outgive good people. I want you to understand that and I want you to believe it because when we believe that and we lead with courage and we lead with intention, lives are changed. Lives are transformed. Just like on this podcast, Transformation Through Primal Adventure. Be blessed. Enjoy this episode. Talk soon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters, both new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. The Soulful Hunter podcast is also proudly presented by the Crazy Elk Company. Based out of the state of Washington with products made in America, they are providing solutions with gear to problems you didn't even know you had. Their tag wall is one of those solutions, and I had the pleasure of using it on all of my hunts this last year, and it is now a mainstay in my kill kit. The tag wall is a water-resistant zippered pouch that comes with its own reusable zip ties to safely and securely store your notch tag for quick and easy access. For more information, go to crazyelkcompany.com and use the code SOULFUL with a capital S to save 20% at checkout. Be blessed, everyone, and as always, stay soulful. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack, and today I got just a cool guest and someone who I've known since my journey of getting into hunting. And this is actually the first time that we're sitting down recording a podcast. Been wanting to do it for a while, but after hearing of his epic story and journey and adventure up in Alaska, I was like, okay, Jared, it's time to actually sit down and and have you tell your story of your hunt and also explain what it's like to prepare for going to Alaska. So without further ado, my man, Jared Larson, what's up, brother? How you doing? I'm good, Johnny. Hey, I appreciate you having me on. It's uh, it's definitely overdue. Um, yeah, stoked to be chatting. It's it's September 1st, so fall is here. Uh, well, and, and my hunting season kicked off wildly early this year. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been a fun 2021 already and ready to get in the elk woods. You know, what's funny is September 1st is like this magical date within the hunting realm. Like, Oh, oh September 1st, September 1st for me getting into hunting, it was all focused around black bears. And in the state of Washington, black bears open August 1st. And so August 1st rolls around. I'm like, yeah, hunting season's here. Let's do this. August can just be so brutally hot. Like, uh, like I, I, I respect the excitement, but boy, I have a tough time, uh, wanting to crawl around in 90 degrees looking for a bear, but I totally all agree. The Dude, 90 degrees and the mosquitoes are just Ooh. everywhere. Super brutal, but not as brutal as I'd imagine is where you were. So let's dive into this. So Jared, you just got back from just an epic adventure hunt up in Alaska. To yeah. Lay, lay, so, well, first off, to give a little background. Like, how did this yeah, all come about? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I grew up hunting. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, my my old man. I mean, he was a hunter to the core for sure. I mean, every year he was going west or 
going to Canada or doing something sweet. So uh, I was, you know, grew up into it. And uh, my brother and sister also were, were into it. And so my sister ended up moving to Alaska in 2015 or 2014. So that was really the connecting dot. And like, as soon as she became an Alaskan resident, there was just like murmurs all throughout our immediate family because within second degree of kindred, an Alaskan resident can be your guide for uh, sheep, doll sheep, mountain goat, and brown bears, or grizzly bears. Uh, you don't need to hire an actual outfitter and guide. So, you know, uh, an absolutely unaffordable hunt for the, the average guy you know, just became pretty affordable if, you know, we could talk my sister into going on one of these gnarly hunts. Um, and so my dad and brother went up and met up with her in 2018 and they shot a mountain goat. Um, they went on a goat hunt together and they got a mountain goat and, uh, I just couldn't, couldn't make that trip happen funds wise. Uh, and so wasn't long after that, that I started scheming with my sister, mostly just like dropping dropping it in all the time. Like, Hey, we should, like sheep hunt, like sheep hunt, sheep hunt, y you know, just like all the time talking about this sheep hunt. And eventually she starts talking about the sheep hunt and, and then it's like, all right, now, now we can get to planning. And so really we started planning this hunt in probably like late 2019. We started reaching out um to like transporters and started to figure out costs and started really looking at maps and figuring out where we wanted to go um just because logistically you can get as complex as you want to in alaska um you know if you're going way north up in the brooks uh, you know there's some options where you could save some money and drive um but then you have to potentially find a car but then living in alaska they live in southeast so we thought about like ferrying their vehicles um because they are not connected to the like the main greater road system in Juneau. there um so there's a lot of logistics to the trip a lot of back and forth a lot of facetime calls um but eventually we we really ended up just picking a spot on the map. Like we did research as far as like ADF and G the Alaska department of fish and game does a really good job um, of keeping track of sheep populations. You know, they post like sheep counts, like aerial surveys and stuff. And actually the, the area we ended up hunting didn't have an aerial survey done, I think since like 2006, um, which was somewhat strategic uh, in the fact that we picked that spot because it's like, oh, it hasn't had an aerial survey done. There's like less information about this one. Like maybe that deters other folks doing this same research. Right. Right. Maybe I overthought it. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, finally, we we got the point where we had a, a flight in and my brother in law is uh pack rafting he loves doing gnarly pack rafting trips like i'm not a water guy i do not like water i will fish in water but like i'm not gonna be jonesing to go on a whitewater pack raft adventure that i might end up swimming down a glacial river like i'm pretty good there <laughs> but, but he he really wanted to come and he really wanted to make it so we could float out on a pack raft trip and so I was like, all right, well, whatever. Yeah, if that's going to get you on the mountain, let's pack raft out. And so, you know, with that in mind, we started scouring the map and, and found a spot there. Um, and it felt like the day took forever to get there. And honestly, the tag application and all that stuff was way easier than a doll sheep tag ever should be imagined. Mm. I, I mean, all I had to do is just buy an over-the-counter locking tag get my harvest ticket, buy the hunting license, and I was good to go. Like, it it felt so easy that I was like, man, I should reach out and, like, make sure I have everything I need to hunt a, a sheep. Yeah. Uh, just because it feels so out of reach, right? Like, I don't think I'll ever draw a Montana sheep tag, and I don't even bother put in for sheep tags in other states. Yeah, that uh, – that that once-in-a-lifetime stuff, it, it gets kind of intimidating, and at the same time, it's like – depressing because you're like okay it obviously only takes once to draw yep. it but the i can't imagine ha like planning out every fall or some this was an august hunt so 
you know, yeah. diff- rearranging different plans to be like, oh, okay, I guess now I'm going to be oh, doing this it. hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Or like, yeah, if you were fortunate enough to draw like two tags that would totally overlap, like, oh. Yeah. Pro- problems I hope to have. Very first world. <laughs> dude, no doubt. So tell me yeah. this. Two, two quick questions to add to the story. Does your sister hunt, or was this like a random extreme, uh, hey, sis, I really need you. Can you please yeah. help me out here? And then uh, was sheep at the top of the list, or was it was it just an opportunity to go to Alaska and hunt this, or or is that your, your dream animal or something like that? Oh, yeah, and interject with any questions. 100% like sheep is at the top of my list. Like that is – that is the one animal. And it's really, I guess, again, because my dad, like he talked about sheep hunting when we were growing up, but it was just like, so out of the realm of possibility. Um, and I guess maybe that's why it's attractive to me. And like, I don't, you just look at a freaking sheep, dude, like, <laughs> come on, like a full curl Ram. Like that's, it's just so sweet. And, uh, and then, yes, my sister is, uh, for lack of a better term, a badass. I mean, she is all about it. Um, she it was very clear that i was going to be trigger man on this trip uh but yeah i mean like we're already talking about a moose hunt for next year yeah and she's like like you were trigger man on the sheep hunt but i'm shooting the moose so like she's yeah she's all about it um, <laughs> that's savage i love that yeah. uh yeah. <laughs> so so here you are you you got your you got your connection in alaska your in-state guide okay. Yeah. And how long ago did you start planning this? Was this two years ago, three years ago? What was, we what started was the planning in 2019. Yeah. 2019, we started like legitimately started looking at maps, like started doing research online, figuring out where we wanted to go, figured out that we wanted to get dumped by plane and pack raft out. Um, so that obviously narrows the options somewhat, but still about limitless in Alaska. Um, and so at that point we were able to find a a transporter, somebody to just drop us by plane. And, uh, honestly, there were not very many dates available with hardly any transporters, especially because there were so many reschedules from COVID and we were initially, we were shooting for 2021. We were at no point ever trying to go in 2020. So like COVID didn't directly affect us, but some of the overflow from COVID certainly did mm-hmm. with like other transporters. So we ended up flying in on August 7th, which was opening day is until August 10th, which I was not opposed to. The The other option I think we had was like August 25th or something like that. Um, because the transporter can only drop X number of, of like parties at any given location within a, a given time frame. Mm-hmm. I don't know those exact specifics. Um, but anyhow, I was pretty happy with getting dropped off on the seventh because my frame of thought was the most legal Rams that there are going to be is on August 10th. Yep. And like, let's go have two days to find a Ram and we'll just sleep on them and shoot them on the 10th. Like that easy, right? <laughs> And so, uh, so yeah, we, uh, I, I left Montana on the fourth and so it was pretty much all Alaskan hunts. It seems our two day journey to get anywhere. Um, and so, yeah, by the time we got up there and got all of our stuff organized and got the rig and made the trek over across the state and, uh, flew out without a hitch, you know, got dropped off by some super cubs. We did like three cubs. Uh, one just took all of our gear. One flew the river with my brother-in-law so we could scope out a pack raft line. And then my sister and I just got to cruise high kind of over the drainage that we had told the pilot that we were interested in, in, you know, tromping up from the main drainage and, uh, just looking for white dots. And dude, it was like, super, super cubs are so unbelievable. Um, that was one of the cooler experiences of the, of the whole hunt. Honestly, it was rolling in that super cub and we definitely saw white dots from the super cub. It was like, that's not a rock. That looks like a sheep. That is so gnarly. So, 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 okay. By the way, this is just incredible to think about, you know, you're, 
the area you chose to hunt was not very well aerial scouted, not much da- data on it. Yeah. So are there a lot of sheep hunters out there? Like, are there certain drainages like, okay, well, there's a couple other parties there or within distance of each other? Or what is it like hunting sheep? So you hear some horror stories. And, like, there was no shortage of airplanes flying around where we were at. Um, but, like, you know, I've talked to, you know, just some sheep guides for being fortunately connected to the industry, you know, because of OnX. And uh, they've had nightmares where, you know, there's, a dozen other groups in the same drainage as them or you know and it's like you get to alaska for that um and so in in our situation there are definitely a lot of resident sheep hunters and actually the transporter that flew us out they're like you know we were just got to talking to them super solid dudes you know they've been dropping sheep hunters off for 40 something years uh-huh. uh, and They're like, yeah, honestly, like if you come back and do it again, we'd recommend that you come back in like, you know, August 20th, 25th, something like that. Uh, Because they just said that like 90% of the hunting pressure happens in the first week of sheep season. Everybody's out there on the 10th. Like everybody's hitting the opening day because they all have the same train of thought, you know, that most sheep that are alive are on that day. And it's like, like, like we were talking about before we hopped on, it's like, august 10th go time like here we like opener man yeah you know yeah so um and sheep hunters are just a different breed right like i'm not a sheep hunter i went sheep hunting I- i'm not a sheep hunter yet sheep hunters are dude they are nuts did man. you get yourself in some sketchy situations oh yeah where oh, you're yeah. like ooh, it, it, my wife wouldn't be okay with this not that you're married but like you're probably thinking my mom would not be happy with me right now <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about my mom not being happy with me, but there was definitely times where I thought if I fall, I'm going to die for sh- like 100%. So is that a, a part of sheep hunting? Like, do you have to put yourself in a position like that in order to kill a ram? Or is it something like that just happened to be how it went because a sheep was in a certain position and you were going for it? Again, I'll reiterate that I went sheep hunting and I am not a sheep hunter. But I would say if you are going to go on a DIY sheep hunt, you are going to get into no fall zones where, yeah, if you fall, it's, it's going to be a helicopter ride out at best. Um, Dang. But again, like that's based off the country I was in and it was definitely some gnarly country. Uh, I mean, there is multiple knife ridges where like we were like hugging the knife ridge crawling, like slow going. Um, Dang. and so you're you're camping down in the valley and then hiking up every day so that's that's not the approach we took uh because you would die <laughs> that was like the most so what the approach we took is we hoofed it in made like a little base camp and then from there we actually spotted a band of rams uh on the ninth the day before season and we decided that we were going to hike the you know 3600 feet of vert up to the top and get above them and kill them from above on opening morning on the 10th. And so we just brought three days of food up to the top because we basically had five days in sheep country just because the pack raft took up multiple days in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And like, logistically, like that was just the way it was. Um, so we really only had three and a half days where we could legally pull the trigger on a sheep, you know, the first two, were before season but anyhow all that to say um yeah we uh we ended up camping up on a up on a ridge up on the very top but climbing those 3600 feet was 100 percent the most difficult thing i've ever done um like it just unbelievably steep so much rock and loose shale and like so much of that rock, like the, the rock formations and faces, it like crumbles when you touch it. So wow. like so often you don't have anything to grip. Everything just breaks and, and falls on you. Um, it's like, walk, it just, like walking uphill with someone pushing you downhill the entire time. Y- yeah. It's like you take one step up and slide a half step down type deal. Oh. Um <laughs> And then, you know, you like you, you end up kicking rocks behind you. So then you end up, you know, either waiting a long time for, for 
you to clear like one stretch and then you know my sister or brother-in-law could go or what have you but we ended up just like all hiking separate shoots which don't exactly love that either because then you can't really see each other and make sure everyone's all good there is no real great way to get up that mountain but like you said we, you were hunting sheep you're not a sheep hunter <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm looking uh, i got your instagram pulled up right now and i'm looking at this last post that you made and that black yeah. and white photo you posted dude that's that i mean you're telling the story right now and i'm looking at this and be like yeah well and anyone that's listening if they want to recap if they go to the onyx hunt instagram and go to our like profile page in the story highlights i did a takeover last week and posted uh, a pile of a sheep photos and I detailed the whole sheep story. Um, so you can go get some visuals there if you're so inclined. That is freaking awesome. Okay, so you made your way up. You got three made day, way you, up. you got three days of, of uh gear to keep you up there. Yeah. What happened? So we spotted Rams the morning of the ninth, hoofed it to the top, evening of the ninth, picked the Rams back up, put them to bed, band of eleven two that we believe are legal at a mile and a half. They got to be full curl or eight years old to be a legal ram. So we are feeling real good about opening morning of sheep season. So we get up at 3 a.m., which it's still pretty dark at 3 a.m. It was dark from about 1130 until four. Um, and so we had like, yeah, a two mile hike to get above where we last saw them at like you know it was probably like 10 p.m when when we lost sight of all of them up into this little cliffy craggy stuff um but we it was snowing when we woke up at three in the morning lightly snowing uh, but it was beautiful it was so beautiful um and so we we're like hunky dory hiking down this ridge and it was we definitely had like one knife ridge that was pretty sketch with headlamps um and then we got to what we called god's thumb we called it god's thumb the whole trip but you know it looked like from holes you know just like right this big, like the very pinnacle of this ridge and getting around god's thumb like it it would have been absolutely impossible but there is a sheep trail probably as old as the doll sheep species just like absolutely worn into these rocks and honestly it made traversing uh, and absolutely just like felt damn near vertical, like just face wow. totally traversable. Like you, it was awesome. Do you feel like you wish you would have like brought mountaineering gear or roped up for certain stuff like this? You know, at times like a rope would have been very comforting for sure, but I wouldn't have wanted to carry any more crap than I already had. I'll tell you that. And I wouldn't have wanted to move any slower than we already did. I tell you, cause like we, we are not moving quick when you're traversing these knife ridges and, and walking this stuff. It's like, it, it's like four points of contact per step. And you know, you're not, you're not moving overly quickly. At yeah. least we weren't. Yeah. Uh, um, but anyhow, we made it over to this knob that we were like, if we get on that knob, we are absolutely in the game to shoot a sheep tomorrow. We get to the knob and uh and i brought a gopro along to to film some stuff just for fun and to have um and the clouds just started doing the craziest stuff and it's like 7 45 in the morning at this point so it's like well light um but like it's blue skies and it's beautiful out and like first thing i did is i pulled out the gopro first thing my sister did wisely is like started looking through the binos i set up the gopro um and i tell you this because you'll see this in the instagram story if you watch it the gopro time lapse maybe ran for like five minutes but it was moments after i set up the gopro my sister was like ram in gun range like she spotted this ram right down below us in gun range and so i didn't even like look at this ram i just started unstrapping my gun from my pack and there was like a much better spot I don't know, five to 10 yards in front of us to crawl to, to get a look at where she said this Ram was. So I unstrap my gun, literally crawl up there. And by the time that happens, two minutes, maybe a minute 30, we're socked in. Can't see, can't see the Ram. Oh. Uh, and so 
we did not get a glimpse at the Ram for the next two hours. <laughs> um, and so at that point, the clouds broke a little bit, saw the Ram. Uh, like first thing I was wanting to do was get a range, which if you've ever tried to use a range finder in heavy clouds or fog, impossible, it's, it's not, not easy. Um, so to make a fairly long story short, we sat on that Ram for a little over six hours got what we estimate to be but maybe a little over five minutes of total view time um and sometimes it was five seconds sometimes it was 55 seconds we all felt like it was a legal ram um but when those things are bedded they are very stationary animals and a lot of times when they bed excuse me and we figure this ram you know when we saw this band of rams go to bed last night like there was 11 of them in the same canyon so like we figured there was other rams around we just couldn't see them in the dense fog um but when when these things bed they'll all face a different direction and they are so stoic like they'll just look in that same direction and i set this up to say that if you can't count the annuli uh ram, you know sheep horns grow rings much like trees do mm -hmm. uh, and when you're close with a spotter, you can definitely count them. That is not how I wanted to determine legality. I wanted to find, you know, a, a massive full curl ram without a doubt was going to be legal. Right. Uh, but I set this all up to say that we simply, in the time that we got to watch this ram, did not get enough head angles to ever even get a overly good look at whether this ram was full curl or passed any of the other tests. But like, heavy bases came way down low swooped back up all of us felt like he was a legal ram none of us could 100 percent be like yeah that's a legal ram let's pull the trigger eventually got a range of 463 yards um that i felt was pretty accurate uh i definitely like cross reference with onyx sitting there with the line tool like yeah, I think that's the knob he's on. Yeah, that says 450 yards. So, uh, yeah. But it is nauseating sitting on the trigger. Like, I had everything but the safety off. Um, it, just but, basing basing it off of clouds and its head movement, and, and that was it. Well, like, well, it was just like, you know, we got a couple looks where – because to determine full curl, he has to be 100, like, perpendicular to you. Like, it can't be an elliptical – um, it's, it's a very, very difficult task to judge a full curl Ram. Um, but like we got a couple angles where it's like, there's no way that thing is not full curl, you know, or that was, that was the feeling we had. Right. Ultimately we ended up just getting, we saw him the moment he ended up like standing up to stretch for the first time. We actually saw that got socked in and clouds never lifted for another couple hours. And at that point we were well into the evening and, you know, had a four hour trek back to the, to base camp. Um, and so we literally just like sat on that Ram all day and, and never, never were really able to determine anything. Um, <laughs> That's so that, gotta be so frustrating. Dude, that hurt real bad, hurt really bad. Um, Especially because, like, there were two Rams that we were all 90% sure were legal the night before watching them. Yeah. So, like, it's just like, ugh. So, whatever. Our spirits were still high. We were like, holy smokes, guys. Like, we are just on Rams opening day, and we had absolutely terrible weather like that. We, we honestly had an amazing day for, you know, visibility being so absolutely terrible. So next day we woke up early uh, and we just were like, well, let's just glass from camp and see if we can't spot something because, you know, we didn't really have much to go off of. Um, and immediately I picked up a band of like seven Rams at 6 a.m. Uh, glassing. And one of them I definitely was in contention to be legal and about in the same little Canyon Cliffy area. So, I mean, we make the all day play to get over there and we ended up dropping I don't know, a good 2,500 of the 3,500 feet of vert down this massive finger ridge because, like, we'd glass these rams up. We'd make some progress. We'd find one. We'd make some progress. Ended up popping over this little top, and here's this ram at, like, 250. Like, we are right in his wheelhouse. Like, I mean, we, we were just sneaking down this ridge and literally just, like, popping our heads over every little – 
you know, every little spot where the ridge, you know, saddled out so we could easily check the other side. Um, and so, yeah, like here's this Ram right there. And so we're all thinking, okay, this Ram is here and there's, he's going to have six buddies. And like pretty clearly this Ram was not full curl when we just saw him at 250 with our naked eyes. So we weren't paying a whole lot of attention to him. We were looking for other sheep. We were sitting on him there for a little while and it's like, man, I don't know where these other sheep are. And you know, there's cliffs and crap everywhere. Like they could be in a million places and you might not see them. Um, and so like we set up the spotter on this Ram and we got to count an annual eye and the thing was seven, seven year old <laughs> Ram and then eight to be legal. And so, and we had actually talked to some, some locals in the area and we got some Intel that a lot of legal Rams where we were at, like, even if they're 10 years old, there's a reasonable chance they won't get to full curl. Like the genetics just aren't there. Oh. Uh, and so like we knew going in that counting annuli might be what we had to do. And so like when we repeatedly counted seven annuli on that thing, it was just like, holy smokes, come on. Um, but is... we sat on that ram for like a half hour and we didn't see any of his buddies. And we were just like, what is happening? And he was like up and feeding and moving around the whole time. Um, and eventually we started throwing rocks to create a rock slide down there just to try to get something to move. Mm -hmm. And I ended up like throwing this, you know, cantaloupe sized rock into this little chute above him, created a pretty reasonable rock slide that slid like 20 yards from him. It didn't even lift his head up. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, he they don't not. care. And like, we definitely heard random rock slides popping fairly often. Like all of a sudden you'd be like, oh yeah, rocks are sliding uh but yeah he could not care at all um and so eventually we literally just blew that ram out of there like we were like all right well this isn't our ram we got to go find these other rams that had what we were pretty sure was a legal ram in it and uh and dude like it felt like we walked to the end of the earth like we just walked down this ridge because those rams like i don't know where they went i have no idea where they went uh buddy of mine up in alaska calls them white ghosts with the golden horns oh. and uh, that's that's what they proved to be on uh, on the 11th there for us like we just never could relocate them um but it was pretty incredible to have that ram at at you know 250 yards um i mean like that phone scope footage i have them um, i can't tell you how many times i've watched that <laughs> it's just rolling on repeat right now as i'm as you're telling the story and i'm just like oh my gosh that would be so frustrating to go it was, to travel as far as you have, to plan as long as you have, to be that close and not be able to seal the deal because, what, an inch, two inches, a couple? I mean, however much further it needs to curl. So, so they claim that a lot of times that there's an annuli under the hairline, um, like a year of gro like a growth ring, a year of growth under the hairline. And so like it definitely crossed my mind in the scope, like looking at it, I'm like, you know, there might be a annual eye that I can't see. I just need to get a lot closer and put my hands on them. But no, there's, there's no way. I mean, there, like, it was absolutely going to be black and white, clear legal, or, or we weren't going to shoot it. My sister works for the department of fish and games. So right. like there was, there there was no messing up for us. Um, well, that's it, funny. Like here goes, this is why you, all you sheep hunters bring a climbing rope with you because that way you can rope up one of these sheep and then count it and then release it. And then be like, it, okay, we'll come yeah, back and you shoot go. you later. <laughs> if you're really good with a lasso. <laughs> um, but honestly, dude, it was like when I was looking at the sheep, it wasn't disappointment. Like it was like complete, like, holy shit. I am too 250 yards from a seven-year-old doll sheep. Like uh, there's so many people on the planet that dream about, you know, just getting to plan a hunt like this. And here I am sitting there looking at the sheep that said, walking home that day, I was pretty disappointed that he was seven and not eight. I was walking that Ridge back to camp. Like, damn, that was that close. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like, uh, for, uh, for any of you who are listening and will shoot any legal animal, when you're counting points and you're like, give me an inch. Give, where's that little yeah. nub? Give me something. Where's Where? the rock time? <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> oh, and trust me, if this sheep hunt was any legal ram, boy, that thing would have been toast. Oh, dude. <laughs> like, uh, there, yeah, no, my st- my standards aren't full curl. Alaska's standards are full curl. <laughs> Dude, thank you. You know, I always uh, was told about this evolution of the hunter. You know, it's like at the, when you first hunt, if it's brown, it's down. If it flies, it dies. And then once you get a couple under your belt, then maybe you can be like, oh, okay, you know, I could start to be more picky and choosy. Or obviously it comes down to the meat crisis. How much meat do you oh, have in your freezer, yeah, right? Meat crisis are real. <laughs> Dude, I'm feeling it right now. I had a heck of a year hunting last year, but because I always split my meat with my hunting partners. And then mm. I just love to give meat away because it's like, oh, you guys yeah. got to try this, you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden I'm looking in my freezer and I'm like, holy crap, man. This is, this is, is it, crunch time. Is it September yet? August? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dude so okay so here you are you're on this hunt it's just close call after close call and then day three happens do you see anything so yeah day three uh we we could not locate any rams that were within the realm of our ridge top um n- nothing to chase so we decided we were going to descend down get back to our base camp and uh and just like head towards the pack rafts because we had we still had to float through a lot of different sheep country that was you know totally fair game um and we actually got down to our little stash camp way up the creek there spotted a group of rams in an adjacent on an adjacent ridge and uh one of them looked to be legal and you know you don't leave sheep to find sheep so we were like well forget going to the pack rafts we're gonna we're gonna sit here put these things to bed and that left us like a one day assault to charge up this mountain and go kill those things the next day and so yeah we we sat around and we actually had a pretty luxurious night that night because we could just like watch these sheep from camp there and um yeah hung out we had a little fire um, this sounds like stuff. just an epic adventure and then you brought oh, a f- yeah. you bring a fishing pole with you also no it was absolutely minimum gear man like i i would have brought even less gear next time i go um it's just everything gets so heavy and those mountains just whoop you okay so let's get into the gear so you plan for a hunt there's always your typical hunting gear that you bring, you know, you're, you got your backpacking kit, you got all your food, yeah. all these types of supplies. What did you feel like you brought that you wish you wouldn't have? What do you wish you would have put in your kit? And, and how did that all play out? So uh, a couple things that were dumb brings on my part, food, I packed food absolutely terribly. Like I don't, everything said like, Oh, you need to have like 3,500 calories a day. Like that's what you need to shoot for on a sheep hunt. Cause you're going to be expending, you know, eight to 12,000. And so I like just went ham on nuts. I just made like trail mix, like literally 1600 calorie, 10 ounce bags of trail mix for every single day. <laughs> I didn't eat probably three quarters of it. Um, uh, just because I was like, man, I did not, I ate two bags and I was like, man, I've eaten enough Brazil nuts for the rest of my life. Right. Uh, and it, like, so moral of the story was bring stuff that you're going to want to eat. And like, uh, you know, if you read some articles about like backcountry hunts, they're like the first, it's not uncommon where the first couple days you just don't, you don't have much of an appetite. Like a lot of people experience that. And I definitely experienced that. And I definitely paid for it because I did not feel optimal for much of that trip just because like you run yourself ragged because daylight is just forever and the terrain is rugged um and then yeah you combine that with like not having an interest in food and that goes south pretty quickly the other thing i brought a sawyer squeeze water filter which i love those things they're great they're not that great when uh it's glacial and silty because uh, they just clogged super clogged fast it, like it's it's worthless like we just ended up aquamere aquamere like the little a b drops if you've ever heard of them yep yep. those things are the real deal but boy i tell you i drank a lot of silt 
I mean, like we just started dipping our water bottles and dropping some drops and drinking it. You're getting your minerals that way, at least. Maybe that's oh, why. We were getting our minerals. That's what, we maybe were that's why you minerals. didn't eat all your nuts. <laughs> you had I'm, enough silt filling your gut. Yeah, I mean, I, I had like uh, just under eight pounds of camera stuff between like uh, all the different batteries and stuff, and then I brought these two extra charging bricks. They're so heavy for my phone and cameras which are i brought two of them so in a di- both of them were like 15 ounces so i mean just in like batteries and camera stuff i had pushing 10 pounds i i would have done better somehow there um <laughs> it's so hard because you're like i'm going to alaska on this hunt i want to do a little bit of filming even if you don't ever yeah. put the content out anywhere like i totally get it as soon as yeah. I started carrying camera gear in my backpack, I don't care if it's a two-day hunt or even a day hunt. Let's say I'm just oh, yeah. leaving the truck. All of a sudden, I'm like, why is my pack so heavy right now? <laughs> yep. Well, and then on top of that, like, I was Trigger Man. I also own the spotter and the tripod. So I had spotter, tripod, and rifle. Mm. So that definitely weighed me down a little bit. Yeah, I always, so one thing with my hunting partners is like my buddy, Tony, we always share a tent, like we, yeah. and it's a two man. It, it, yeah. Like you better really enjoy each other's company and, and you learn how to sleep with other people. It's, it's like a dance inside the tent. Like, okay, if he rolls on this side, then I'm going to roll on this side and we're going to, it's hilarious. At least you're in a mummy bag. Like at least you're contained. <laughs> right. And so, but how we end up splitting up gear is, is either I'll take the poles or he'll take the poles and stakes and then I'll take the tent. Uh, yeah. You know, always carrying the spotter, love phone scope footage. And so, you know, but now you're carrying a camera gear. And so it's like, okay, well, you have to have a tripod for the camera and the spotter and the phone scope. But at the same time, you know, another tripod for the camera, because if you want to be able to, dude, it, it gets, uh, it gets out of control out of very, hand quickly, very fast. I can understand yeah. why people hire cameramen to come with them. <laughs> and those dudes, their packs are crazy heavy. Dude, honestly, some of the cameramen in the outdoor world, like the Stephen Drakes, if you will. Yeah. Dudes, uh, just nuts, you know, Uh, and and especially the ones that are also like when the hunter harvests critters where you see cameramen packing around their camera gear, taking photos and they got a quarter on their back. Those are the real ones there. Yeah, dude, respect for sure. Yeah. absolutely okay so what are the the takeaways from this hunt um and, and if your story's not even finished continue on but well, like i mean i this is a story i can summarize from there and the fact that once again the uh the the white ghosts with golden horns eluded us um you know we, we thought we had a great play for the next morning and then we spent the entire day not finding um these rams that that we thought we uh we had pegged for the next morning like never saw them at all ever um so i I don't know they went over the top or who knows Um, but then with with planning for a hunt out of state and having it be like this epic adventure and uh, do you feel like an extra amount of pressure to actually fill your tag oh i used to i used to so bad what is how do you deal with that or what what's your mindset going into a hunt where you're putting so much money effort and energy just to get to where you are to hunt the animal and then you're like oh crap i gotta eat tag soup tonight yeah well first off i think it just takes eating some tag soup to be okay with eating tag soup i mean honestly like i can remember just being crushed a couple times like driving home when i was in college you know hunting elk out west or or you know if i drew an iowa whitetail tag and, you know, on my last trip to Iowa, I was driving home without a buck. Like, I can remember being just, like, so, so bummed about it. But now, like, that sheep hunt, man, like, my expectations were to go up there and just have a gnarly adventure with my sister and brother-in-law. And, honestly, my goal was to see a legal ram. And and I felt, we felt in total that we saw three legal yeah. rams. So, I felt as though we... Uh, crushed our goals would i have loved to kill a sheep yeah 
oh yeah i would have loved to kill a sheep <laughs> but i mean like when we were walking out of sheep country because basically after those rams ghosted us we had to we had 88 miles to float out of there so we had we had a couple of good days of floating on our hands um like we were we were cursing sheep hunting and cursing the mountains for just whooping us and then as we were sitting in the pack rafts, so we were like, all right, so like 2024, where are we going to sheep hunt in 2024? You know, like we are already, we we're like, we got to do a couple other species, but we're going to revisit these freaking sheep up in the mountain because we got some unfinished business here. So like, yeah, it, it's always disappointing to fork up a bunch of money and, and go on a hunt and not come home with the critter, but at the end of the day, if if a, a dead critter is your benchmark of success, you are going to have probably a short and not very fun hunting career. So change your mindset. Enjoy the journey for what it is. Um, the one thing that I really loved about sheep hunting is, is even when you're just getting your ass kicked, like absolutely just, I mean, we saw everything from teens and snow to sleet and rain and I, we saw sunny and 60 i mean we got everything and i mean that that was the best part about it is just like looking back on it i just want to be back in the sheep mountains it's addicting oh it it has a draw man like it pulls hard what's so talk about that unpack that for the listeners so it it's different it, it it's it but it calls to you for some reason. Like, obviously, it's a bucket list animal because it's not very yeah. easy to attain a tag for it. But beyond yeah. that, beyond the the difficulty to draw a tag, what what was it doing for you? Yeah, dude. So I, I mean, it, it was a couple of things. So like, knowing that just so many other people are never going to be able to hunt that species because they don't have the financial resources or the sibling resources. <laughs> um <laughs> shout out sister hey oh <laughs> yeah so like that in and of itself makes you pretty grateful to be able to do a hunt like that um but then i i also think the the allure to it for me was because like my dad never did it and it was just like you know growing up everybody thinks their dad is so great you know whatever it, it, like oh man my dad can do anything and he like never went sheep hunting. And so like that always stuck with me. I was like, man, I really got to go sheep hunting and I got to figure out, I got to do it early. And so like being able to go sheep hunting at 26 and literally we're already talking about going again in three years. Like if I get to go sheep hunting twice before I'm 30, like that's insane. Um, but the draw, I think just comes from a, it always helps to have incredible people, uh, that you're with on these hunts. Like, I don't mind hunting solo. Like I, I really like hunting solo on like day trips, but I would never do a 10 day like backcountry solo trip. Not a chance. Like for me, half the experience is the camaraderie and totally. enjoying the company and enjoying misery with someone else, you know, is <laughs> sharing, half that. sharing misery. Misery loves company, right? Isn't that the saying? <laughs> Something like that. Um, so like that's a big aspect for me. And just like getting out there like the country was just so unbelievably large and awe-inspiring anywhere that makes me feel really small i'm drawn to those places um uh, which I, th I think that's like innate human nature like that's why people like yosemite that's why people like glacier national park like you walk into these mountains and you're like oh my gosh like how is that a yeah real thing? yeah i and like Oh, I was gonna like just, that's what you feel on elk bugles, isn't it? Like when an elk bugles yes. in your face, you're like, "This is a real thing that I get to do." Like that's the feeling I get. So for me, I love feeling like I'm in a position where no one else has ever been. You know, <laughs> some places of hunting, like you're like, "Okay, I know other people have been in this location," and that's why I love hunting the mountains. Is like, okay, I might be the only person to ever put my feet right here right now and yeah. and to me it's like we i don't know it's like how many people have ever ran a marathon right it's a small percentage of the population of the world and then you take the marathon people and you say well how many people have actually ran an ultra marathon and then it's like that just shrinks down it's like so for hunting or being in the wilderness or being on these grand adventures you start thinking about out of all the people in the world 
you, Jared Larson, stood on that mountain with your sister, your brother-in-law, and like talk about yeah, memories. It's an interesting perspective to put it in and to like, yeah, marathons and ultras and what have you. And I guess in like the ski community, like a first descent or what have you. Yep. But yeah, like it, it was, it was some cool country and yeah, it was just awesome to be out there and, and see it. And I mean, anything that's like that out there too, like it's, there's something about the, the fairly fine line of not life and death. Cause I like, at no point where we're in a life or death scenario, but like the unforgivingness of where we were, like if something went South, it was going South, you know, mm-hmm. like you have to be on your game and, and aware as well, which I think adds to the experience. And, it, you know, it gives you pride to be like, okay, like I just weathered, you know, 11 days in back country of Alaska. So. Yeah. Sweet. But like it, it's powering almost. Yeah. It's like, I did that. What else can I do? Here we go. Yeah. Like how much further can I take this? Will, will I enjoy 20 days? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> My like 10, 10 is about max. Yeah. 10, 12, anything more than 12. If you can do more than 12 days unsupported in the back country, that's some next level stuff. Did it dump rain on you at all? Oh yeah. Do you feel like your rain gear held up? Um, my rain gear held up other than when I, uh, slid about 65, 75 feet down a shale field and absolutely ripped <laughs> the butt out of my rain gear, my long johns and my flesh. Um, uh, but other <laughs> than that, yeah, rain gear held up solid. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's brutal. Okay. So you were able to cut out some serious dollars by not having to hire an outfitter, uh, for oh, pile. Yeah. Like, so what was, you know, if you feel like sharing and I'm putting you on the spot here yeah. because it, oh, it, it takes, you know, these adventures take planning, how much money and how did you go about saving for this? So I, I didn't <laughs> keep exact track of how much money I spent because like, frankly, it didn't really matter that much to me, Yeah, but I would conservatively on the low end, I would say four thirty eight four high end five. So I figure I spent about 4,500 bucks, five yeah. grand, something like that. Um, well, if you go on, like, let's say people, they love to cruise, right? When you're, oh. it, it, anytime you go on a vacation or you're doing something, doing it on a budget, like a stringent budget, like, okay, I'm on the cruise ship, but I can't actually go do this because I'm so tight on my money. It makes it tough. And at the same time, it's like, you know what? YOLO. Right. You only live, oh. you only live once. Let's get after this. And let's really, my make... mindset's always on the YOLO <laughs> side of things. Like whatever I'll retire when I retire, I'm going to go out and do stuff while I'm young. Reverse retirement was always something that I wanted to do. Like not work while I was from 25 to 35 and then just work till I was dead, you know, because those are my prime years to go do cool stuff. Dude. I, that is so funny to hear you say that. I totally I totally understand that and get that and grasp that concept because when I got into hunting at my first year of hunting was, I was 30 years old Yeah, and I'm looking at these draw permits in the state of Washington. I'm like, dude, it takes like 15 years to draw a, a bull elk tag and, and all these things. And I'm like, dude, am I even going to be fit? Right. Yeah. Like <laughs> how, how am I ever going to draw these tags? And by the time I do, you know, obviously I work out and I take care of my body, but like I ain't 28 anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta do, you gotta be willing to, to spend some money and go through some planning. But that said, like $5,000 for a out of state hunt is absolutely not the bar I want to set here. If you give yourself 1200 bucks 1500 bucks you can scrounge your way into some out-of-state hunts probably not an elk hunt for that price maybe like a utah spike bowl or you can maybe scrounge out a colorado elk hunt for 1500 bucks if you have to travel some state lines um but i mean deer are a little bit cheaper i mean a white tail or mule deer or like black bear hunts are pretty cheap out-of-state hunts yep um and they all offer great experiences like at, like at the end of the day that's what you're looking for is is a time with good buddies and sweet spots. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think it's about, about five grand, but I would say the, between 
the logistics of getting to our fly out spot of like, you know, renting a vehicle, the fly out itself, getting to Alaska, um, you know, those three things alone were 15 to, um, I was always told that you also have to plan for buffer days because if the, if you're planning on hunting like a certain amount of days, but the weather rolls in and all of a sudden you can't fly like yeah. like you've made it all the way there and then you're shafted or even on the back end like for them to come pick you up and now you were floating out so that well, you didn't have to at work. least at least on the back end though like at least you'd be hunting still <laughs> right <laughs> um, sorry babe i can't make it home today the... yeah it turns out i gotta hunt a couple more days i'm weathered in <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is so wild. Okay, so how did you end up going about uh, picking your uh, the pilot for the Super Cub? Oh, is, is, the is, one that was available? Really? <laughs> oh, like it was, dude, it was hard to find a transporter. And I mean, like when, if you want to go moose hunting in a couple of years, like when I say you need to start piecing together some plans, like finding transporters in Alaska is uh, is definitely not, super easy i mean a lot of them you know they just have repeat customers and that's who they prioritize um and so you know bob goes caribou hunting next time well bob comes back and he's gonna go moose hunting this year you know like um it's definitely not as easy as it it should be to give somebody a thousand bucks to get flown somewhere (laughs) right please take my money please yeah like like... okay (laughs) it's gonna be 1500 fine like just get me there right Oh man, that's so and that was wild. kind of my whole mentality for this whole trip is like, I don't care, just just get me there. So like, whatever. With, with you kicking off your your 2021 hunting season on such an epic adventure, yeah. what, what's the plan for the rest of the season? Is it taking a hit because you did this, or like now now what? Like, is it everything else a wah 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 kind of scenario? Or are you still super jacked about your hunts that you got planned? Yeah, no, absolutely not a wah, wah, wah. I mean, I got, uh, I mean, I live in Montana, so I I have no room to complain. I mean, I got resident elk tag, mule deer, well, actually just general deer tag. Um, And then I'll chase Wisconsin whitetails and Arkansas whitetails. Those are my other two hunts. But I have been telling people that depending on how this fall goes, I might uh, turn to a sheep hunter and move to Alaska myself. So. Uh, we'll see we'll see what happens well if you do i'm gonna come hunt sheep with you up in alaska hey yeah come come along i can't really guarantee anything uh other than you being a cameraman unless <laughs> unless i get my guide license but <laughs> i freaking love it how did you choose arkansas whitetail out of all your all your places to go whitetail hunting <laughs> So, uh, are you familiar with Clay Newcomb? Absolutely. He's been a guest on this podcast. Awesome dude. Oh, has he really? Yeah, dude. I was on the cover of his magazine this spring. You got <laughs> Did you not see this, this edition of uh, bear hunting magazine with Johnny Mac on the cover? <laughs> oh, dude. Yours truly. <laughs> hey, you yes. Know. Come on now. Uh, I'm hunting with, with Clay and one of his like good hometown buddies. And, uh, yeah, we're going to chase some. Some Arkansas mountain bucks. Dude, he is an incredible human being. Clay is like one of the coolest people I've ever come across in my life. Yeah. Everything he says is gold. <laughs> and and how he says it. Like oh my the, gosh. the accent definitely helps. You know, like he's got that mustache and just like how he carries himself. And like, dude are you a walking encyclopedia? Like how much knowledge yeah. is up inside he that? Is, brain? Yes. It's yeah, incredible. Yeah. He's, he's one of a kind. So what time of year is that? You're going to go in November, uh, December. December. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Like uh November 28th through December 4th or something. So apparently that's, that's some pretty prime time in that part of the country. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, like just to get to, to go spend time in camp with, uh, with clay will be awesome. You guys going to take the mules out? Dude, I hope so hard Izzy is there. I don't know if Izzy's going to make the trip, though. Oh, man. Dude, so I had an opportunity uh, this last year to hunt with Clay. He came okay. up He came up with, to the state of Washington, and he went on a, on a bear hunt. He was going to record a podcast. There's a, 
a hound company, hound uh, hunting dog company that is a sponsor of the podcast sure. for him or what it was, or maybe the magazine. Yeah. And he was like, Hey, you know, any decent bear spots that you can help point me in the direction. And I was like, for you? Yeah, absolutely. And he's like, by the way, do you want to come? And I'm like, <gasps> Yes, yeah. but I already have this hunt planned and I got this thing going on. I'm like, doggone it. Um, so we're going to make sure he comes back up for, for a hunt here soon because he's the man and I, I want to make sure I, I take care of the people that take care of me. And he's been an amazing person. You know, the very first published article that I I got to write in a magazine was for Clay and bear, bear. hunting. So Nice. He's yeah. a bear hunting fool, dude. Savage. Such a savage dude. All right, bro. Thank you so much for coming on this episode, telling your story all about your Alaska adventure. Um, man, good luck this coming year. God bless you. Go dominate. I can't wait to see what else is coming up. And uh, is there any new awesome features with Onyx that are dropping soon? That you any oh, any, t- any like little teasers you want to put out there? Oh yeah, I'll I'll throw it out there. So. Uh... We got improved offline maps coming up. This should all be out within the next, I, I mean, when this podcast airs dang soon. Um, improved offline maps. So you're going to be able to basically choose a custom area um, with custom resolution. So if you want eight gigabytes worth of a highly detailed saved map on a large chunk of Washington, go for it. Yeah. Uh, um, so that'll be slick. And then uh, foldering and the ability to bulk add waypoints into folders you create. So if you have a pile of waypoints on your map, the ability to quickly and easily organize them into folders, which we will soon be able to share them. Probably not till like towards the end of the hunting season, but you'll be able to share, you know, like a, a folder, like of, a folder of waypoints rather than having to go through each individual one and, and keep kicking correct. them out. And like you can, if you want to throw lines and areas or any markup into these folders um, and then you can just seamlessly share them, a track, whatever. Um, so that'll be sweet. Uh, wind, wind on a waypoint. So you can like, you know, see wind visually on the map at any you know location. Uh, and then particularly helpful for tree stand hunters uh, like optimal wind. So if you have multiple tree stands set, you can set the optimal wind for that tree stand location. When you pull up your app, it'll tell you like, uh, eh, good wind in this tree stand today, bad wind in this tree stand today. Um, so solid feature for folks that are sitting for whitetails there. Uh, and then we're coming out with some tree species data. Have you seen the new crop data layers at all yet? I haven't gotten a chance to dive into that yet. So much. So basically the crop data layers, we just released those two um, in July. They tell you what was planted in 2020, allowing you to figure out based on crop rotation, what's going to be planted this year. So you know, helps you locate uh, sure food sources, um, you know, for finding critters. Obviously, egg is a major food source for a lot of critters across the country, uh, be it elk, you know, mowing down alfalfa fields or whitetails and cornfields. And then the tree species data is going to be pretty similar. Uh, it's going to show pre- what the predominant tree species is in any given 30 yard by 30 yard area um so again like would be super helpful for picking out like oak trees for folks hunting in in the whitetail woods or uh like clay clay loves hunting over them acorns Uh so the acorns you can maybe (laughs) maybe find some of them uh them arkansas bears mowing down acorn acorns using the onyx app um that is so cool we're, we're working on some stuff for sure can i tell you the most the two most simple things on onyx that like for me, blow my mind. And you told, and you totally forget about it. And the Dylan, when I had him on the podcast and we were talking, um, for I always love to save offline maps. And I'll be like, okay, I'm going to save this offline map and then I'll have it for next year and I'll have it for the yeah. year after and all that. But if you save an offline map, it doesn't update with all the new features in it. And so when he was like, yeah, make sure to delete your old offline maps and re-download them, I was like... That sounds so simple, and yet because you just set it and forget it, that is something that people need to be aware of, like to update the feature so everything is fresh and new. Yep, and we actually have started to do like more push notifications and in-app messaging around that. Like, hey, make sure you go to resave, re-download your offline maps, because like now 
like you can literally just put update like you don't have to delete them anymore if you go into any saved map um you can just go in there and there's an option to update the map and it'll just real quick spin it up for you so if you don't even need to delete and resave anymore there you go i i love that the other thing is <laughs> and this is like if you want to be a dick or someone burns you or something like that being yeah. a, being able to withdraw a Revoke the waypoint. <laughs> yes <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, I see where that will come in handy for certain situations. It's it's kind of nice, but at the same time, it's just like, well, if you send Bob that waypoint and Bob burned you, Bob probably still knows where that spot is and dropped his own <laughs> waypoint. But I agree, the sentiment is nice. It's nice to be able to say that f you by unsharing that waypoint. I gotta tell you, there in all the people listening, if you've ever shared a waypoint with me. I'm definitely not stealing your spot. However, I do know because I know Onyx now. I'm like, okay, well, someone shares a waypoint. I need to actually save my own waypoint over top of that. <laughs> Be like, okay, I'll come back. Well, to I need to make sure I get this one mark just in case I burn this guy. <laughs> that is so cold. There's got to be another, like a better angle of explaining why revoking a waypoint is important. I don't know. I, I'm not... I don't know that there is. I'm pre- that's, why we, that's why we built it oh my gosh that's so awesome okay so listeners if you did not know jared uh, works for onyx and onyx is an amazing company and they are a company that uh, supports washington backcountry and the soulful hunter podcast and we support them and so if you do not use onyx i highly encourage you to go check it out uh you get a it's still a two-week free membership right uh, seven day, seven day free trial, no credit card required. Um, you just can sign up with an email address and a password and put her to use. I would say definitely do that uh, on a hunt at some point this fall and shoot for, uh, you know, uh, about the price of gas or what gas used to be. You, you can buy a, an Onyx membership and uh, I it, like it'll that. probably be what, to use the most. What gas used to be, dude, I, my my gas lights on my truck and I had to park a specific way in my driveway. So you know how, like if your car sits for a while, all the gas oh, runs yeah. at one. So I'm like, okay, the gas lights on. Uh, and how much further can I get with this? Because I don't want to, I have to fill up my truck twice just because I reached the, the debit card limit and it shuts you off. And then oh, I have yeah, to yeah. keep filling it up. Yeah, like, dude, dude, I mean, I'm up over a hundred bucks to fill my F-150 and it's just like, I do not let gas determine what I'm going to do on the weekends. Like I I consider it a sunk cost. I don't look at gas prices, but when I'm paying triple digits for a tank of gas, like then I start to be like, I got to sit at home this weekend. Right, dude. Like, (laughs) like. I didn't go antelope hunting last weekend because all antelope hunting is, or at least for me, archery antelope hunting is drive around until you see one, stalk them, get busted, drive around. Like you can easily burn two tanks of gas in a weekend. (laughs) Oh, dude, take me with you. I want to do that sometime. So, oh my God, that's the easiest hunt ever. 920 archery antelope tag, buy one next year in Montana and y'all I will put you on stocks until your hands are bleeding. We'll be begging for mercy. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right, Jared, thank you so much, brother, for coming on this podcast. We're going to make sure that your uh, Instagram link is in the show notes as well as Onyx so that they can go check out the story. Uh, go check out his pictures. Give him a follow. Just awesome, dude. Also, I just want to shout out before we let go, Jared was one of the original people that did the This Is How I Hunt series that can be found on Washington Backcountry and Soulful Hunters website. He's number 13. And we go through some questions there. He he shares some insight and, and all that. And so do you even remember doing that? I do. I, I was laughing. I was like, oh, that was way back. <laughs> Dude. I love it. It's good stuff. Can't out give good, baby. This is what it's all about. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Soulful Hunter Podcast, everybody. As always, freedom on and stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter Podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com. 
And be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful.